in the war against drugs. I see a syringe on the floor back there. Every war has its casualties. What's that you got there? That's 15 pounds worth of heroin. This is what happens if you inject straight into an artery. Usually it will happen within minutes or hours of doing the injection. They took all the puffs from there and plus four inches inside. This is abscess caused by bad gear. The images of those who've suffered in the war against drugs have become as familiar as old pictures from the trenches of the First World War. Of course, it's often been said that the first casualty of war is the truth. And in the war against drugs, we lost touch with the truth a long time ago. Surrender to the drugs menace. We couldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. And we won't do that. For years, British politicians have been courting the law and order vote by promising to get rid of the drugs problem. The idea we are now considering is to create a register of hard drug dealers the police must be informed of all changes of address. It is a new weapon in the battle against the dealer. Last year, Britain spent £1.7 billion on the prohibition of drugs. It's become a world war. Every developed country has been dragged into it. There's no sign of any of them winning. But the hidden truth is even worse than that. I want Britain to be the hardest place on earth to deal in hard drugs. Politicians who have supported this war have created the very problems which they claimed to be solving. And we can either choose to surrender to that, or we can choose to fight it harder. I've spent the last 20 years reporting on crime and drugs and poverty, and I have no doubt that this global campaign of prohibition is the most dishonest and most destructive social policy of our time. I don't think it's had any side effects that have been disadvantageous to me anyway. The first thing you need to know about the war against drugs is that beneath the military rhetoric and the deaths and the massive expense, there's one great big lie. You can talk to just about anybody you like, politician or ordinary member of the public, and they'll tell you that we have to ban some drugs for the very good reason that they're poisonous. They ruin the minds and bodies of their users, kill them often. The truth is a lot more interesting. Take opiates, for example, like heroin and morphine, which are different versions of the same drug. Think of all those official anti-heroin messages and meet 71-year-old Bernard Varley. I, I still read, I write, I drive. I'm very active when I can get away on holiday. My interest is archaeology, so I read up about it and I spend hours on a site. Mm -hmm. um, so my mental capacity, as far as I'm aware, is not affected in any way. Through the Marie Curie Hospice in North London, Bernard Varley started taking morphine five years ago to control the pain of his bone cancer. Morphine is an opiate, exactly the same in its effects as heroin, which doctors refer to as diamorphine. Bernard takes up to 400 milligrams of morphine a day, a considerable quantity for any drug user. Yet if you believe what the politicians tell us, Bernard Varley should be a wreck, some kind of walking zombie. 
the difference between Bernard Varley's experience and the familiar image of the heroin-crazed junkie lies right at the heart of the big lie. Heroin has a big drawback. It can be highly addictive, and it's a very bad idea to start using it. But the truth is that pure opiates, properly prescribed and monitored, do not damage the minds or bodies of their users. But all these different opiates, morphine, diamorphine, and the various little subgroups, they're, they're essentially the same, are they, in, their, in terms of their effect? Well, morphine and diamorphine are very similar, yes. Diamorphine um, gets metabolized in the body very quickly to morphine um, and then works in exactly the same way. I think people who are used to it now feel that morphine is a very flexible, easy drug to use, mm -hmm. um, which is, provided one uses it appropriately, a very safe drug to use. Not unusually dangerous. Not unusually dangerous, no. In a 25-year career as a cancer doctor, Teresa Tate has prescribed morphine and heroin for hundreds of patients. The most common side effect, which happens in almost everybody, is constipation. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody gets constipated with morphine, but with all other strong painkillers as well. Mm -hmm. and probably about one half of people may feel sick or actually be sick when they start taking morphine, mm -hmm. and one can manage that. Um, that side effect will only last for a few days usually, and uh, patients will feel fine again afterwards. Mm -hmm. And those are really the two most common side effects. Constipation and a few days nausea. It might make you drowsy too, but it's a long way from heroin screws you up. But then of course, there's the question of overdose. Politicians are always telling us how deadly heroin is. How does that strike a specialist doctor with 25 years experience? Supposing we take two drugs that, you, that patients use, heroin and paracetamol. Are we able in any sensible way to say which of those might be more likely, A, to damage your body, and B, to kill you? Well, I think um, that most doctors would tell you that paracetamol is actually quite a dangerous drug when used in overdose. It has a fixed upper limit for its total dose in 24 hours, and if you exceed that, um, perhaps doubling it, um, you can certainly put yourself at great risk of liver failure and of death. Whereas um, with diamorphine, should you double the dose that you normally were taking, mm -hmm. I think the consequence would be to be sleepy for a while, and quite possibly not much more than that, and certainly no permanent damage as a result. This sounds unbelievable, that you can take pure heroin without being damaged, that it's less likely to kill you than a drug we sell over the counter without a prescription, and yet scientific opinion is unanimous. The available evidence indicates that heroin, when provided in pure form, is a relatively safe drug. When heroin-dependent persons have been provided with daily maintenance doses under medical supervision, marked physiological deterioration or significant psychological impairment has not been observed. Heroin is very addictive, but does not in itself cause any serious illnesses nor does it harm any organs or tissues. And the more you look, the more bizarre the truth becomes. Compare pure heroin to sugar, for example. Dr. Russell Newcomb lectures on drug addiction studies at John Moores University in Liverpool. Pharmaceutical heroin compared to clean, pure sugar is less harmful. It won't rot your teeth, it doesn't cause breathing problems, it doesn't make you obese, uh, and doesn't cause any of the other health problems that sugar can be associated with. The strange and generally untold truth is that, properly prescribed, opiates like heroin are very safe drugs. The politicians have got it wrong. For years in this country, the prime users of opiates were people who had become addicted after operations, like the soldiers who'd been given shots of morphine for their pain in field hospitals in the First World War. Thousands of them. They became addicted, they were given a daily supply, and they lived healthy, productive lives. Look hard enough and you find there are some surprising names among those who combined life in the public eye with their addiction. 
the children's classic National Velvet was written by somebody who was to become what politicians would call a smackhead. Enid Bagnold spent years injecting morphine, which she got quite legally for an addiction she had developed after a hip operation. She lived until she was 91. Clive Froggart was the health advisor to a sequence of Tory health secretaries. He was also a heroin addict. As a GP in Cheltenham, he spent three years until his arrest in 1994 forging prescriptions and supplying himself with regular doses of pure heroin. I had to go to the pharmacy to get it, and um, as an addict, um, I did realise that if I, I got too much in one go, that I would tend to overuse it. So basically, I had to go to the pharmacist every morning before surgery. Um, I would, I would uh, inject between four and eight times a day according to um, what I was doing. And so far as actually the injections were concerned, I really didn't have any more difficulty than, than a, a diabetic on insulin. And during the time when you were using before your arrest, you, you were advising the government on health policy? Yes. So did that mean that you were, you were going in for meetings with important people in Whitehall, ministers and so on? Yes. Yes. And did they ever detect anything in your behaviour or suspect? No, not at all. I mean, one of my tennis partners was the consultant in charge of addiction locally. He didn't. Mm -hmm. He didn't know. So, you know, n nobody knew. The big truth about the real danger of illicit drugs is concealed beneath all the rhetoric of the war. The epidemic of miserable deaths and ghastly side effects is not the result of the drug itself, but of the black market on which heroin is sold. Dirty drugs with all kinds of horrible impurities, dirty needles carrying lethal infections, accidental overdoses from deals of unknown strength. Prohibition creates the very dangers it pretends to be removing. In America in the 20s, gangsters brewed up illegal moonshine laced with things like meths which blinded drinkers. There is no drug which becomes safer when you hand over its production to criminals. Once you struggle free of the big lie, the whole idea of prohibition becomes an absurdity. Then you can see that many users would be better off if we offered them a clean and legal supply of their drug. We could call a halt to the whole war. More and more specialists are starting to question the very idea of a war. Professor Jerry Stimpson is Director of Drug Research at Imperial College London. The war on drugs really is a war against drug users and that's a war against a large proportion of the adult population. It's a war against four out of ten young men who've used an illicit drug in the last month. Mm. And it's totally unrealistic. Mm. Uh, I would like to see less drug use, and I'd certainly like to see less harmful drug use, but you, you don't get there by having a, a war on drugs or a war on drug users. Labour MP Paul Flynn is another who's seen through the big lie. The reason that they're dying from the use of illegal drugs is because of prohibition. It's because the market is controlled uh, by criminals and they're getting the most dangerous form of drugs and taking them in the most dangerous ways. Specialist drug advisor Alan Parry has no doubt about the real choices facing us. At the moment, the choice is not between kids not taking heroin taking it. It's where they get the drug from. Yeah. At the moment, if they're going to take heroin, they're going to take it anyway. But now they have to get involved with criminals, like dirty drugs with no advice, maybe with dirty needles. I came to Brighton as they remembered the casualties of war, men who often died wretched and lonely deaths. Brighton now has the highest rate of illicit drugs death in the country.
Seja cabei! Ah! Ah! Drugs are the biggest single cause of death here for men aged between 20 and 44. You may think you know what has been killing these young people. But look again. Remember Enid Bagnold and Clive Froggart and look again. In the doorway of an old dole office in the middle of Brighton, I talked to Brian Henderson, a heroin addict for years. I used to work at the Royal Mail. What were you doing? I'd, uh, I used to work in the main sorting office in Glasgow, worked shift work, met a girl, had a mortgage. Settled down, yeah. sort of thing. The next thing, uh, I met someone that I went to school with in the pub one night. I hadn't seen him for about oh, 13, 14 years. He's like, do you want to come back to my flat for a smoke? So I came in as, as in a joint. Yeah. Came back to his flat, and the foil was out, smoking heroin. That first night of heroin smoking set Brian Henderson off on a steep downward path. Just as Enid Bagnold might be a classic heroin user for her generation, so Brian Henderson is typical of his. There was no legal daily supply for him, and so his stable life fell apart. So I feel taking Mondays off, then it was Tuesdays off. Everything, I lost everything. My dad's a taxi driver, uh, but also he had cash every, every day that he started stealing his money. Pawned mum and dad's jewellery, pawned the video, pawned the television. When his best friend died, Brian ran away to Brighton and found himself homeless. He slept in doorways, begged for a living, stole sometimes. But much worse was to follow. Because he was not allowed to get clean heroin with clean needles, Brian started to suffer horrific illnesses. That leg, the, the right leg, uh, injected my groin constantly. Yeah. And one, one day it started to come up in a small lump. Yeah. Then again. The next thing it was the size of a golf ball. Yeah. And the pain was like something got me a red hot poker. In your groin? In your groin. Right. Brian was rushed into hospital. The main artery in his leg had blown out into a huge swelling, horribly infected by countless injections with dirty needles. Brian came in with a, a huge infected aneurysm in his groin. That means the femoral artery in the groin, instead of being perhaps uh, that size mm -hmm. was that size. The whole thing had been destroyed by a, a, a process of infection mm -hmm. and necrosis. They operated on Friday. I came round on uh, Sunday yeah. and they explained to me what had actually went on and they told me to look at my leg. What did you see? And it was just a big hole that you could put, fitted an orange into. It was just, it was disgusting. And they said to me uh, how close I was to losing my leg. So they, you had the hole the size of an orange in your leg. Yeah. They've told you that they've nearly amputated it, but maybe they've saved it. But the fact is that after that, you carried on shooting gear. Yeah. Is that the still... same leg? The other leg. Okay. I moved to the other side. It's not just dirty needles which wreak havoc. There's an even nastier story in the stuff which dealers mix with heroin. With a local phone call, I was about to get the recipe. I had been given the telephone number of a former heroin dealer in Brighton. Hi, it's Nick Davis. Hello, Miss. Uh, have you got a moment to talk about this thing? Yes, sir. No. Okay, so what, what do I need to bring with me? He agreed to show us how he used to cut his drugs. We said we'd get hold of some of the imitation heroin that's used sometimes by police and customs, and he gave us a shopping list of things to bring with us to his home. OK, so the, the full shopping list is your large G-clamp, glucose, something like paracetamol, some sand. And that's the lot. OK. All right, well, we'll see you later. But have you ever come across a street dealer who was selling pure, unadulterated heroin? No. It's always got something in it? Yeah. I've heard of people putting in drain cleaner and things like that. Yeah. Drain cleaner? Yeah. What is, that, is that in a powder? It comes in crystals and they just crush it down. You know? And right. fucking that's lethal. Is it? Because it's, it's just a poison. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I'm going to put some paracetamol in. Got people mix any and then with them bad bitches to make you make you when you take it and make you feel drowsy and that so you think you you've had stronger gear, you know. Okay. I'm gonna make it into a, a brick form. Cause it people think that when it's in solid mm -hmm. that it's being like messed with less, you know. Can you pass us that tube thing? Which tube thing is that? It's like the old tube looking. The impurities themselves can cause clots and infections, but just as bad, users have no idea how much real heroin there is in their deal. They can end up with three or four times their normal dose without knowing it, which is how they come to overdose. <laughs> bloody great G-clamp. Yeah, yeah. I'll put a lot of pressure on it now. But basically what we've done here, we've taken 300 quid's worth of gear, added glucose, paracetamol, sand, and made ourselves 700 pounds in, what, a lot less than half an hour's work. Virtually every user we talked to in Brighton had a story about bad gear. Terrible physical injury is like a membership card to the black market drugs club. When Anna Lefford was a girl in London, she spent all her free time with horses. She was the kind of adolescent girl that Enid Bagnall wrote books about. She took exams and qualified to work in stables, and then she became a heroin addict and hit the black market. Or rather, it hit her. All I could see was just great huge lumps, all, all together. Um, and my whole leg had sort of turned a completely different colour. Um, but now... Uh, show you them now. They're not too bad. Well, this is the le this was. is this leg, is it? Yeah, this leg. That's where they took. Um, they went in my leg by about four inches in. There's a cavity that goes up into here. And they took all the pus from there mm. out and plus four inches inside. Mm. And this side, that one there. Jesus Christ, Anna. I mean, that's what they done, and they took. All that around there, out, all around there. That's how big it was mm. before it started to heal. It took two inches out there and about four inches deep. And this was, out. this was, right. This was abscess caused by bad gear. Let me put another one in there. It's quite a thick pedicle, isn't it? Yeah. Probably, volume-wise, the main injuries that the hospital gets are abscesses. What's that they check with the veins? The yeah. veins will tend to Good. occlude if they're... Uh, that means they fill up with blood clot if they're repeatedly uh, injected. Right. I have got some examples of, of the sort of damage that can that can occur. This is a obviously a, a foot with gangrene on the, the the toes. Now, this is what happens if you inject straight into an artery. Uh, the artery here they probably injected to was somewhere up in the at the Around ankle. ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what happens is the all those areas supplied by that artery. Uh, will get thrombosed, they'll get blocked up. It's usually what it's did, did this in. person's toes get saved? Or is that beyond uh, No, saving? they're gone. Really? They're gone. Gone forever. There's a, a, another example of uh, injecting, probably that was probably into the brachial artery, which is up in the arm, uh, yeah. up at the elbow rather. And again, the same thing's happened. This yeah. skin is, is in trouble here, uh, and the, the end of the digits of the gangrenous. So they've gone. Once it's black, it's gone. Abscesses and amputations, horrible infections, accidental overdoses from drugs of unknown strength or from cocktails with alcohol and tranquilizers. The blessings of prohibition. Charlie Jarman Gower has been using drugs in Brighton for 17 years. My friend Paul is dead. And Rubin? Rubin's died, yeah. Just a run through a list of his friends tells you all you need to know. And Tracy's boyfriend? Yeah, he died as well. David, his name was. Joe? Joe died as well. Wayne? Charlie reckons he knows a hundred people who have died this way. Not victims of drugs, victims of the war against drugs. John? John, he's dead as well. And that's not the end of the damage. This war actively encourages social exclusion. Users are so busy chasing drugs that they lose their jobs, and so they lose their homes. They don't buy food, their health deteriorates. 
they become even more excluded by starting to steal in search of money for the black market dealers. And so they not only hurt themselves, but the whole community around them. I talked to Vic Marshall, who's a detective inspector in the Brighton Drug Squad. Are you able to put any kind of figure, even if it's a kind of guesstimate, on the amount of property crime that gets committed by people who are involved in the drugs war? There's really no great figures on how many people involved in crime are in, actually involved in taking drugs as well. But certainly from my personal experience of seeing people who come into custody, who ask to see uh, the doctor, for example, because yeah. they need methadone or other um, form of medication, um, I personally would put it as high as 75% for the more serious crime of, of stealing from people's houses, street robberies, in order to fund their drug habit or in order to um, be brave enough to actually commit the act in the first place. The most graphic illustration of the link between black market drug use and crime came in the form of a drug addict's diary which we were given. Once you're addicted, getting the money to pay for your drugs is all you care about. Thieving or grafting becomes second nature. Sunday, 3rd of September. Got up. Had three lines with Harry and Bill. Went grafting. Got a microwave with brownie. Got a rock and dig. Went to bed. Shit day. Tuesday, 5th of September. Got up. No gear. Got two quilts. Scored. Went to town with Brownie. Bad from supermarket. Got paint. Went to Pam and Dick's. Sold it. Got tools from DIY store. Sold them. Got rocks. <laughs> Mad night. Monday, 11th of September, living at Cass, signed on. Went to supermarket, got toys. Went to DIY shop, got tools. Sold toys and tools to Pam, score. Went home, dead. Social exclusion, crime, disease, death. You have to go back to the First World War to find generals who have managed a war with such staggering disregard for their own people. With a strategy built on a lie, politicians around the world have denied drug users a safe supply of the drug to which they are addicted. They've created a black market which relentlessly inflicts the kind of damage they say they want to prevent. Their policies have imposed a crime boom on the very communities which they claim to be protecting. And attacked and maimed and killed the very people they claim to be helping. But what if our leaders called an amnesty? What if they called a halt to this futile cycle of physical damage and crime and social exclusion? Marcia Leishman lives in Plymouth. She's a heroin addict, just like the ones we met in Brighton, except that she doesn't have abscesses or ruptured veins, and she's not skidding downhill into despair and death. Indeed, when we met her, she was planning to come off heroin for good because she's lucky. Just like Enid Bagnold, she's got a doctor who is allowed to prescribe her pure heroin. Dr. Anne Reed is a psychiatrist who specializes in dealing with drug addiction. She's one of the very few doctors in this country who prescribes diamorphine, heroin, to users under a special home office license. We've reduced it very gradually, yeah. with a couple of admissions for the bigger reductions. Yes. Yeah. And all you've been taking is the diamorphine. Is the diamorphine? Yeah. 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 Whereas before you were on loads of Valium and Tamazepam as well. Methadone. And I stopped all that, remember? Yes. Refused it. 
It's not yeah. only that I am orphan, it's, it's also me. the counselling and support that you've had and you being prepared to work through yeah. help myself. I think that's why I don't get a lot of visitors, because I'm upstairs. <laughs> it's quiet life. Yeah. Um, You're right. Yeah, I'll just put these lights on. Not all of Dr. Reed's addicted patients are given heroin, but when it was decided that Marcia was a suitable case, Dr. Reed established exactly the right dose for her. Cup of, tea, cup of coffee. Um, coffee would be good. Yeah. Thank you. Would you like. Uh, and as with all her patients, Marcia is subject to random urine checks like to make sure she's not using illicit drugs. Having been stabilised and brought out of the black market with all its dangers, Marcia has received psychiatric help to deal with the problems which pushed her into drugs in the first place. Street drug use is a full-time job. Yeah. You know. Whereas being on a prescription, you collect your prescription from the chemist in the morning, you have the rest of the day free. And for people who've been full-time in illicit drug use for years, that leaves them with a huge amount of time suddenly on their hands. Mm -hmm which they can use to work with their children, to look after their children better, to look at work, to look at returning to education, to focus on their relationships, to stabilise their accommodation, to get rid of their rent arrears, things like that. None of Anne Reed's patients has died or been made ill by her prescriptions. Indeed, research presented to the Royal College of Psychiatrists shows that her patients are better at avoiding trouble and are more healthy and socially stable. What I feel encouraged by is that they very definitely commit less crime. They also feel physically and psychologically better and find that they can go about their normal lives more easily. Marcia Leishman spent 10 years as a black market heroin addict, selling drugs to fund her 500 pound a day habit and then finally selling herself. For two years now, Marcia has had a prescription from Anne Reed for heroin. Freed from the black market, she no longer needs to sell her body, and she's cut down her use of the drug to the point where she's ready to stop. If it wasn't for Anne, I don't know what I'd have done. Where do you think you'd be now? I think I'd be dead. Really? Really, yeah. I've never got to. Sorry. There was times, you know, I've called Anne everything under the sun, you uh -huh. know. But if it wasn't for Anne Reed, I wouldn't be here just now. I'd be dead. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, this is the... Given the rhetoric of the government's war against drugs, you might expect DC Mike Bradley of the Plymouth Police to take a dim view of Dr Anne Reed's work. Are you a happier or an unhappier man? knowing that Anne Reed is there doing what she does? I'm certainly happy because if she wasn't there, then I can certainly see that the people who aren't getting treatment would have to turn to some sort of crime to fund their addiction. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of research that's been completed that shows that um, people who are in treatment, it doesn't mean to say that those people will stop committing crime, but I think what it does mean is that certainly their, their crime will be reduced greatly. Okay. Um, so for every person that's on a treatment programme, there's going to be a reduction in crime. While Anne Reed was taking addicts out of a life of crime, local police launched other initiatives to get more of them into treatment. And the politicians ought to be very interested in what happened to domestic burglaries in Plymouth. With just over 4,000 in 94, 95, uh, last year we're down to 1,880. I mean, that, that is a dramatic fall. Yes, it okay. is. Three decades ago, Every heroin addict in the country could get a clean legal supply, just like Marcia Leishman. There was only a tiny black market and nothing like the epidemic of illness and crime from which we now suffer. Then in 1968, the rules changed after a scandal blew up about a handful of doctors who supplied drugs for cash. A restrictive licensing system replaced doctors' freedom to prescribe heroin. It choked off most of the legal supply to addicts and ever since then, the black market has been booming. Back then, there were fewer than 500 heroin addicts, poets and musicians and some of the Chinese community in Soho. Now, the Home Office says there are between 300,000 and half a million addicts in this country. And do you know how many of them have access to clean, legal heroin? About 450 of them.
Each year, our government spends more money on the war against drugs. The official policy is to fight on three fronts, education, treatment, and law enforcement. Last year, treatment got just 13% of the cake. Two thirds, the bulk of the money, was spent on law and order. And treatment is bedeviled by the myths about heroin. The government won't let ordinary doctors prescribe it. It allows them to give a substitute called methadone. 20,000 people have prescribed it. The trouble is that experts say methadone is more addictive than heroin and more likely to cause overdose, and a lot of users just don't like it. It's horrible. It's absolutely disgusting. It works for some people, but you, 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 can, you can then become addicted to that. Yeah. And the, the, a lot of people think withdrawal from methadone is worse than withdrawal from heroin. The withdrawals are worse. The methadone withdrawal is the yeah. worst, the more painful and yeah. difficult. A lot of people think, seem to think that. Actually, I agree with it is. Do you like the methadone, Jess? Do you like the buzz? No. What's wrong with it? Um, it's not the same buzz as heroin at all. It's nowhere near it. Mm -hmm. You you still feel very sleepy. That's probably about as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. um, to the actual buzz of feeling like heroin, it doesn't make you feel warm or content. Mm -hmm. it makes you feel nothing like that. A lot of users say they just sell their methadone and use the cash to buy black market heroin, with all of its dangers. In the meantime, the government is trying to get more doctors to prescribe methadone and running into extra problems. Some of the doctors say that new prescribing rules are too restrictive. Others say they're frightened of prescribing methadone because of a sudden surge in police activity, which has seen some GPs being arrested. Yes, we need more GPs working in the field, but it's rather like two bits of you know, government pulling in, 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 in different direction. I mean, GPs, for the most part, have to be... Um, I mean, you have to do a lot, of, a lot of work to encourage GPs to work mm -hmm. in the field. If they get frightened, frightened of courts, frightened of police, or mm -hmm. restrictions on their clinical, you know, their range of clinical freedom, yeah. it's going to be very difficult to keep them on, on side. In theory, doctors can supply heroin if they get a license. But government rules say that only specialists should have this power, which cuts most GPs out. Only 120 doctors are actually licensed to prescribe heroin, and they are officially discouraged from using the license. Thirty years ago, when the new licenses stopped most doctors prescribing heroin and the whole war against drugs was launched, the aim was simple. If we cut off the supply, then users will stop using. But is it working? Nowadays, with the black market booming, Keith Hellowell, the man who advises government on its whole drug strategy, is not even beginning to talk about cutting off supply. But he claims he can reduce it. The aim is to reduce the availability of drugs on our streets, and particularly heroin and cocaine. And we've set targets over the next, well, it was 10 years of the strategy, but by 2008, we aim to reduce them, heroin and cocaine particularly, by 50% availability on our streets and by 25% by 2005. The police do their best to disrupt the UK drug trade, although even Mr Hellowell admits that it's not that effective. Inspector Vic Marshall has been involved in three major operations against Brighton's dealers in the last year. These people will never stop. Um, taking the risks of dealing in drugs, uh, there are substantial profits to be made. Um, what we're trying to do is obviously take out the main dealers um, in order to try and disrupt that supply chain. But it's like you're winning battles but you can't win the war. Is that fair? I don't think anybody is, will ever say that we will ever win the war against drugs. Um, the drugs will always keep coming in. It doesn't matter how many operations we do, um, there will always be another gang which will take their place and those are the next people that we have to target. 
the big plan is to hit the supply routes overseas, but the size of the problem is now quite staggering. Interpol say drugs have become the most valuable commodity on the planet. The UN say dealers trade more than a billion pounds worth of drugs each day. And Home Office figures show that we seize more and arrest more, and yet the number of users keeps going up. I thought Keith Hellowell might be worried that the price of heroin keeps falling while purity keeps rising, suggesting that the supply of drugs is even greater than demand. It's too early to say. I mean, it's a 10-year strategy. Yes, what is happening in terms of these indicators, which you put forward, which I feel, feel are pretty frail, mm -hmm. but on those indicators, um, there appears to be no difference at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, that is true. However, what we are intercepting, mm -hmm. can I say, what we Go are on. intercepting, particularly offshore, particularly further up the line, mm -hmm. is quite substantial, and it is increasing. I went north to Liverpool to see if there was any sign of success for Mr. Hellowell up there. In part of Merseyside now, you can buy a gram of heroin yeah. for as little as 20 pounds, okay. and the police will confirm this. Okay. The quality is higher, generally, than it's ever been. It's more easily available, and it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, in parts of Liverpool and many other of these cities, you can get heroin delivered to your doorstep quicker than a pizza. Yeah. <laughs> we thought we'd test that. So, one dull morning in a peaceful residential area of Liverpool, I sat down with a regular heroin user. If I was to say to you, how long would it take you to go out and get some gear in this city now? I could probably walk out of here and get it within 10, 15, 20 minutes tops. Really? Yeah. If, if you've got some cash? Yeah. OK. If, if you show us that you can go out, mm -hmm. buy heroin, yeah. And we'll, we'll time you, yeah. just, and this is for Keith Hallowell's interest, yeah. to see how long it takes you just to walk out of here. And what is it? It's, a, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning, so it's not like night time, everybody's out in the streets yeah. doing crazy things. Yeah. OK, if you set off just about now. Right. OK, go for it. The law refers to illicit drugs like heroin as controlled drugs. The truth is that in more than 30 years of prohibition in this country, politicians have never had any kind of control over them. And even if they did, what would happen? The price would start rising, so addicts would commit more crime. The purity would start falling, so there'd be more illness from dirty drugs. And in the meantime, on the Home Office's best estimate, Dealers successfully smuggle something like 20 metric tons of heroin into this country each year. Just 10 minutes after he left, our man was back with some of it. Well, that didn't take you very long. No. I reckon you left here at 9 minutes and 20 seconds past 11. Yeah. And the doorbell went at 19 minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah. All right, so that's taken you exactly 10 minutes. Exactly. Yeah, so what have you got? What's that you got there? That's 15 pounds worth of heroin. Okay, that you just got. So, roughly speaking, what have you just done? Walked to the bottom of the road, rang someone up in the phone box. Yeah. They came out and met me. Because what they do is they drive around the area where there's a lot of people buying, come out meeting in the car. It's like a mobile supermarket. Yeah. Okay, 10 minutes. Mm hmm. It's that easy. Yeah. How long does it take you to get a pizza delivered around here? Probably double that, treble oh. that. If it's the weekends, up to an hour. Yeah. <laughs> We took the black market heroin off him and disposed of it. I have spoken to four chief constables who say the war is hopelessly lost and it's time to make clean heroin available to those who need it. But the politics of the war against drugs mean that they won't speak publicly. However, there are encouraging signs other people are now prepared to speak out. Among these are two veteran MPs, both of them from the government's party, and both of them passionately opposed to our drug prohibition. I would certainly ensure that genuine heroin addicts got clinically pure heroin. And, and when you uh, remember that in the last few months we've lost 
I don't know how many people, but certainly 45, maybe over 50 people in, this, in the Glasgow region, Merseyside and Manchester region, through selling on the street biologically contaminated uh, heroin. If we'd had them registered and, and, and been giving them pure, clinically pure heroin, we wouldn't have lost all those people. Uh, the best way of reducing drug deaths is to collapse the illegal, irresponsible black market and the only way we can do that is replace it with a market that can be licensed, policed, controlled, and that will reduce harm. And there's still this complacency, this feeling we have the secret, we're about to turn the corner. You know, they've turned the corner so often, they've been around the block a dozen times. And every single year, we have more deaths, more drug use here. But it's Not been fueled by pure politics as well, isn't it? Not by some kind of interesting medicinal point it, of view. Or... Yes. It, it's been fueled by politicians who are vote gluttons, who yeah. believe there's popularity and votes to be gained by appearing to be tough on drugs. But we have to challenge them and say, you're killing our kids. The words of these two MPs are echoed by experts who've spent years studying drugs. We all have to first of all agree that this war on drugs, the prohibition, is, a, is a, not only a failure, it's producing the problem. Yes. It's not only ineffective, it's very effective, it's causing a lot of harm. Yeah. We admit that's failed and start looking at new ideas. Yeah. If you look at any of Hallowell's policy documents, legalisation isn't even mentioned, and if it is, only to rule it out as a possibility without considering any evidence for or against it as a viable policy. Yeah. So unless somebody in his position or at his level starts to change you know their minds and talk honestly about you know what is really the source of our drug problems prohibition things aren't going to change much it's often said that if we legalize drugs more people will use them but it's clear that anybody who wants drugs can already get them with great ease hundreds of thousands beg steal and prostitute themselves to buy heroin alone. The key to solving our problem is to recognize that it's not the drugs which are causing the problem. The crime, the social exclusion, the injuries and the deaths are all the result of the black market created by politicians. We should go back to the old British system. Doctors should be freed to give drug users as much as they need for as long as they need it. That way we can keep them alive and well until they can start to come off their drug. We can end this cruel infliction of misery and illness on vulnerable people. We can roll back some of the social exclusion which plagues our cities. We can kill off the epidemic of crime which users inflict on our communities. We can save ourselves more than a billion pounds a year. We can do all this if only the politicians will abandon the big lie. Two programmes from Four's Drugs Laws Don't Work season tomorrow night. The use of cannabis at five past eleven, followed by an examination of the increase in the use of cocktail drugs by young people at 11.35. It's Big Brother next. Who do you think is the most disliked? If you'd like to talk to someone about your to as diamorphin. Bernard takes up to 400 milligrams of morphine a day, a considerable quantity for any drug user. Yet if you believe what the politicians tell us, Bernard Varley should be a wreck, some kind of walking zombie. The difference between Bernard Varley's experience and the familiar image of the heroin-crazed junkie lies right at the heart of the big lie. Heroin has a big drawback. It can be highly addictive, and it's a very bad idea to start using it. But the truth is that pure opiates, properly prescribed and monitored, do not damage the minds or bodies of their users. But all these different opiates, morphine, diamorphine, and the various little subgroups, they're, they're essentially the same, are they, in, their, in terms of their effect? Well, morphine and diamorphine are very similar, yes. Diamorphine um, gets metabolized in the body very quickly to morphine um, and then works in exactly the same way. 
I think people who are used to it now feel that morphine is a very flexible, easy drug to use. Mm -hmm. um, Anybody you like, politician or ordinary member of the public, and they'll tell you that we have to ban some drugs for the very good reason that they're poisonous, they ruin the minds and bodies of their users, kill them often. The truth is a lot more interesting. Take opiates, for example, like heroin and morphine, which are different versions of the same drug. Think of all those official anti-heroin messages and meet 71-year-old Bernard Varley. I, I still read, I write, I drive. I'm very active when I can get away on holiday. My interest is archaeology, so I read up about it and I spend hours on a site. Mm -hmm. um, so my mental capacity, as far as I'm aware, is not affected in any way. Through the Marie Curie Hospice in North London, Bernard Varley started taking morphine five years ago to control the pain of his bone cancer. Morphine is an opiate, exactly the same in its effects as heroin, which doctors refer to. It's been said that the first casualty of war is the truth, and in the war against drugs, we lost touch with the truth a long time ago. Surrender to the drugs menace. We couldn't do that, we shouldn't do that, and we won't. For years, British politicians have been courting the law and order vote by promising to get rid of the drugs problem. The idea we are now considering is to create a register of hard drug dealers. The police must be informed of all changes of address. It is a new weapon in the battle against the dealer. Last year, Britain spent £1.7 billion on the prohibition of drugs. It's become a world war. Every developed country has been dragged into it. There's no sign of any of them winning. But the hidden truth is even worse than that. I want Britain to be the hardest place on earth to deal in hard drugs. Politicians who have supported this war have created the very problems which they claimed to be solving. And we can either choose to surrender to that, or we can choose to fight it harder. I've spent the last 20 years reporting on crime and drugs and poverty, and I have no doubt that this global campaign of prohibition is the most dishonest and most destructive social policy of our time. I don't think it's had any side effects that have been disadvantageous to me anyway. The first thing you need to know about the war against drugs is that beneath the military rhetoric and the deaths and the massive expense, there's one great big lie. You can talk to just about in the war against drugs. I see a syringe on the floor back there. Every war has its casualties. What's that you got there? That's 15 pounds worth of heroin. This is what happens if you inject straight into an artery. Usually it will happen within minutes or hours of doing the injection. And they took all the puffs from there and plus four inches inside. This is abscess caused by bad gear. The images of those who've suffered in the war against drugs have become as familiar as old pictures from the trenches of the First World War. Of course, it's often 